Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus is intense right now. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Before you take a seat, turn to your neighbor and ask him this question. Are you the real deal? Ask your neighbor. Are you the real deal? You guys can be seated. Somerville, sit down. North Charleston, sit down. McClellanville, get up. Are you the real deal? I got nervous in this room a few weeks ago. I saw a friend I haven't seen a while in church. And so I was connecting with him. And he said, hey, I want you to meet a friend of mine. And so we walk over and um, he introduces me to his friend. And his friend is looking at me with a mild smile, but high levels of suspicion. I can see it on his face. You know, you read people too. So I shake his hand and say, hey, it's really nice to meet you. And I'm smiling and I'm trying to be as warm as possible. And I could see him be warm enough to be polite, but he wasn't buying it. Because, you know, we speak without words. Side note, that's what we've lost in our culture today with text. Because you can't see the expressions that make conversations happen. So anyway, so... My friend picking up that his friend wasn't receiving me well, he said, hey man, Joel is amazing. Joel is the real deal. And when he said that, his friend looked me up and down for about half a second, and there I was standing as he analyzed me if I'm the real deal. And in that moment, I got nervous because I was like, well, what does the real deal stand like? Do I stand like this? Do I stand like this? I didn't know what to do. Have you ever been in a moment where you know that someone's analyzing you if you are the real deal or not? Job interview. Your resume's there, but you're trying to prove to someone that you're the real deal. Meeting the parents for the first time. You ever been in that moment where you're trying to show someone Hey, I'm the real deal. I'm the one you've been praying for since you were little. (laughs) Are you the real deal? A few weeks ago, I was in the parking lot, and uh, it was a long day of work. My kids were coming out of the church with me, and my wife was there, and this Suburban rolls up. That's the standard-issue car of Mount Pleasant. If if you move to Mount Pleasant, they just give you a Suburban, okay? Um, And so... Uh, my wife goes up, the lady is driving the car, talking to my wife, and the kids are in the back seat. So I go over and talk to the kids. My kids are in my truck, and I'm talking to the kids. And they're wearing the uniform of the private school in our, in our town. And I went to a private school too, and so I started talking about that, and I'm trying to be the real deal. You know, I'm their pastor, so I'm trying to figure out a proverb to say in my head. And side note, for you parents that send your kids to private school, You better pay attention to them kids because what you thought saved them, they just get really good at doing the crazy stuff. So keep your eyes on them. Pro tip. Pro tip. (laughs) Um, So I'm trying to figure out how to say some nice things to these kids to prove to them that I'm a pastor in their life. And my kids are playing in my truck. And then all of a sudden, the hood music that was playing softly in my truck to soothe my spirit after a long day of ministry, gets thrown up to 10. And in the parking lot, all of a sudden, this music that I don't want y'all knowing I listen to gets blasted. And if I was a little bit lighter, I'd have turned red. 
And while I'm shocked, my wife grabs her phone and starts recording what our kids are doing in the truck. We got secret Delph dances that we do at home. We don't do that in public. And all of a sudden, they're doing it in the truck. And this is what we saw. Look. I'm not the real deal anymore. And in that moment, my credibility is just gone. Jesus, in this passage, he's telling us, how do you spot the real deal? How do you spot a true prophet, a false prophet? Prophet means two things. Prophet means one, someone who understands the times and by the power of God is able to predict things that have not yet happened yet. Prophet also means teacher of the word of God. And because the position of a prophet is powerful, Jesus knows that there's people who are going to come and use that position for their own uses. Joel, it's 2022. Do people still have a prophetic voice in the nation? Absolutely. This time last year, a lady who lived behind us when we lived in Greer, South Carolina, invited me and my wife over. And she said, hey, when y'all moved in the neighborhood two years ago, God told me that you weren't going to be here very long, so I've been praying for you every single day. My dad was sick in the hospital with COVID this time last year. And this lady at her house, she said, hey, the word of the Lord is this for you. Your dad will pass away, but he's releasing you so you could go back into ministry. I was in the corporate world. And she prophesied that I would be back in ministry. She prophesied in detail where I would go, what would happen. And I'm standing here preaching a sermon to you a year later because in part of the prophecy of a woman that confirmed the word of God in my life. So prophetic voices are still real. They're still alive and active. This isn't just a Bible thing. This is alive and active today. And Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. And so I'd like to take a few moments to go verse by verse and share some takeaways as we glean from the word of God. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. False prophets come to you as people in sheep's clothing. Why? Because they want to look like people of peace, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. What does a wolf do? A wolf hunts to sustain its own life. And Jesus is saying, watch out for those false prophets. Here's my takeaway from that verse. False prophets have always been a problem. False prophets have always been a problem. Look at this in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel speaking. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are now prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, Hear the word of the Lord. So since time has begun, we've been always fighting false prophets. Verse 16, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? This is a takeaway from that verse. Where you search for truth matters. Where you search for for truth matters. We live in a day and age where there's no shortage of information and there's no shortage of people who assume this position as a purveyor of truth, but where you search for truth matters. What podcasts you listen to matters. The social media influencer that you follow and what you glean from them matters. The talk shows you listen to, the radio shows, all these places where we consume knowledge, where you're searching for truth matters. And sometimes we unknowingly expect that we're going to get a grape when we're really searching for it in a thorn bush. Verse 17, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Jesus is saying this, good teaching 
produces good fruit. Bad teaching produces bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Take away here. Consistency speaks. When you're looking for truth, look at what is consistently being shown because that way you can identify if this is a good tree or if this is a bad one. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Takeaway here, God guarantees correction. God will handle every bad tree. Thus, verse 20, thus by their fruit, you will recognize them. Takeaway here, recognition comes from fruit over feeling. Recognition comes from fruit over feeling. What the teaching produces is what we need to look for more than how it makes us feel. A friend of mine started working for a preacher that I was convinced was a fraud. And I asked him, I was like, hey man, what's it like living with them? What's it really like? And he's like, bro, he prays for me every day. Like he has done things for my family in ways I never thought possible. He's generous. He's humble. He's self-deprecate. I was like, all those things. And all of a sudden I realized that I was looking at him, judging him by what I felt about him more than looking at the fruit. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Take away here. Obedience is our expression of our love for God. We are saved by grace alone. But the fruit of the grace that we have received is our obedience to follow Jesus. We follow him by obeying what he is calling us to do. When we do not obey, what we start to do is make our belief systems rhetoric and thereby rendering it useless. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Here's my takeaway here. Even Judas walked near Jesus. Before the betrayal of Jesus from Judas, Judas's rap sheet was externally perfect. He was a man who had the money. You should trust that guy, right? Verse 23, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Here's the takeaway here. He sees our heart. So those are the takeaways from the verses. And I just wanted to answer this question that's been in my heart as I've been processing through this scripture. How do we spot a real one from a fake one? How do we spot one? First thing is this, check the root. Check the root. When you are in the search for truth, look for what they point to. Look for where the source of their power is. Specifically, when it's the word of God, does it make the word of God better and bigger? Do they proclaim this? Or is it something where they're more concerned about bringing glory to themselves. Second thing, look for fruit. Look for fruit. When you hear the word of God, when you see it being preached, ask yourself this question. What does their preaching produce in thought and in application? What does this preaching produce in thought and application? Do my thoughts shift to things higher? Is the Holy Spirit convicting me while the word of God is being preached? Can I apply it into my life that allows me to walk in better alignment with who God's called me to be, with what his word confirms? Or am I trying to live my life off of motivation that lasts for a moment but doesn't sustain life-giving change? Third thing is this, let God be the judge. It's our responsibility to discern but it's God's responsibility to judge. What's the difference between discernment and judge? Judging is when we start to sentence people based off of what we think they deserve. 
But you remember Pastor Josh Walters a few weeks ago, he came out with the judge gavel and, and was talking about let us not judge. Why? Because when we judge others, we get out of our spot of being teachable and being humble and being learners, and we put on the garb of becoming a Pharisee. Why does this matter? Why does it matter to spot a real one from a fake one? A bunch of years ago when my dad, my dad passed away last July. He was 79 when he passed away. When my dad was in his 30s, a new preacher came to town. And the new preacher came to town and he was different than anything that people had ever seen before. The church was highly integrated. Um, it was very charismatic in worship. Tons of money was being flown into the church. And he's like, wow, what's going on over there? And so he went to the church and he checked the route. He said, hey, what's the source of this power? And when he started listening to the sermons, he heard that, man, this preacher is pointing more to himself than the word of God. My dad started looking for the fruit. What is the fruit of this preaching? How does it change your life and thought and application? My dad said, wow, this only leads back to this man. And so my dad said, you know what? I'm not going to be a part of that church. Uh, that church was in a town called Jonestown. The country was called Guyana. And my dad lived there. He grew up there, was born there. And in 1978, the lead pastor of that church by the name of Jim Jones led 900 people into a ritual. And they said, hey, let's drink the Kool-Aid. And 900 people died. Where we search for truth can literally be a matter of life and death. You may not drink a Kool-Aid physically, but false teaching dissolves trust and can lead you away from the presence of God. As I was preparing this sermon, I started thinking about what false teaching produces and what it costs us. I started thinking about the fact that when I saw that passage in Ezekiel, I realized that this has always been a struggle whenever the word of God's being preached. This has always been a struggle that's been around the church. And in a room this big, false teaching has all cost us something. We've all met leaders who may have hurt us. And as a pastor in your life, I just want to take a moment to apologize for any of you who've been hurt been abused, been led astray by false teaching. That's not the heart of God. That's not who he is. And with no strings, with no caveats attached, I just want to apologize if you've been hurt by the church. I just want to say I'm sorry. I may have caused it. I may have not have caused it. But as a pastor in your world, I'm sorry if you've been hurt. Let's continue in God's word. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. It says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Why did Jesus put this in the Sermon on the Mount? When you see the Sermon on the Mount and you think back of what we've seen through the last few months, well, since January, what you can see is that the Sermon on the Mount has been unlocking in so many different ways who God is. And then Jesus says something that seems to be so cutting. And I think these are two things that really hit my heart when I look at that passage of scripture. I think what Jesus is saying is this, your beliefs matter and what you do with what you believe matters more. What you do with what you believe matters more. And for those of us who've been walking with Christ for a while, sometimes when the newness of our faith wears off, we can become academic learners of the word of God. 
versus voracious appliers of the word of God. We can become so comfortable with just hearing it and saying that's good than saying, wow, God, how do I apply this in my life? And the moment we stop applying the word of God is the moment when we stop believing it. I always notice this in high school and in college. There's two different types of coaches. There's the coach that can tell you what to do, and there's the coach that knows how to do it. Have you ever seen a personal trainer out of shape and wonder, bro, how are you teaching me how to do ab exercises when you ain't got the six pack? And believers, knowing the word of God is important, but knowing how to apply it matters even more. Do you know you could do a lot with just a little bit of knowledge that you actually apply into your world? And so today, I want to encourage you, believer, to apply the word of God to your life. I want to encourage you, Christian, to live out what God is convicting you to do. I don't know it. Holy Spirit does, and he's talking to you right now. And if he's not talking to you right now, say, God, what do you want me to do with all this? He will speak to you. That's the thing I love about our faith is I know it's alive and active because of what the Holy Spirit does in moments like today. And so what you believe matters, but what you do with what you believe matters even more. John chapter 15 is an amazing passage of scripture. And I want to encourage you to read through that whole chapter this week. In John chapter 15, Jesus uses the same analogy of this plant and this tree bearing fruit. And he's talking to us as believers in John chapter 15, verse 9, it says this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you, commit, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus wants us to remain in his love so our joy may be complete. Do you need a little bit of joy in your life? Do you want it to be complete? We'll remain in his love. How do we remain in his love? We obey his commands. Obedience doesn't take something away from us. It adds something to us. And so we remain in his love. I'd love to take a moment to pray for us before we head into response time. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. We thank you, Lord God, that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord God, that when we walk the narrow gate, you unlock a world of life in us. And we ask you, Lord God, that this week we can be a people who obey your word. Give us vigilant eyes to search for truth. Give us vigilant eyes to prune and run away from pathways that lead to death with false teaching. We ask you, Lord God, that if we've been hurt by false teaching in our life, will you mend those wounds in our heart? Jesus, we need you now more than ever. And we ask you, Lord God, to continue to be our guide. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.